For those of you who are already on the line, we are going to get started in just a few minutes, just waiting for others to join. So hang in there and we'll get started shortly. We'll go ahead and get started as others are joining the call. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grafton Integrated Network's webinar on navigating autism services for adults. We're glad to have you join us. Before we get started, I just want to provide an overview of a few housekeeping items. Um, here is a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface that you should all have. Um, on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening uh, uh, using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Everyone except the speakers are muted today, but we do want this to be a discussion uh, and to be interactive. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenters by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them so that they can be addressed during the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason your question does not get answered, we will collect them and try to respond to you shortly after uh, the webinar is completed. Um, in addition, we welcome you to join us throughout this conversation on Twitter. You can do that by using the hashtag Grafton Approach. So with that, I will now turn the conversation over to our host for today, our moderator, Scott Zeider, the Chief Operating Officer of Grafton Integrated Health Network. Thanks, Julia. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> we are so glad that you've been able to, to, to join us today to talk about a really important subject which is what happens when individuals with autism age out of state mandated children's services. Often um, when we think of autism spectrum disorder in the public sphere, the individuals who come to mind are children, uh, early intervention services or resources to help families with school age kids. And while those are crucial to supporting the development of children with autism, there is a gap generation that is often forgotten. There's a real challenge we're facing in terms of the growing adult population with autism spectrum disorder. When individuals are in the school system, it's legally mandated that they have access to various kinds of therapies, such as speech therapy, occupational therapy, or applied behavioral analysis services. But once they graduate, most of them lose those or access to them. And they may transition to a group home or forms of group therapy, but often without one-to-one -one support, the skill levels might even regress. So the question is, what do families do when adult children with autism age out of public support systems? And today we want to spend some time talking about the issue. We want to talk about what happens when children age out of the state support system that provides services like speech and occupational therapy. Joining me today, I'm, I'm lucky to have Bethany Dietz, Grafton's Director of Adult Services. Uh, she also leads the Adult Day Activities Program Team, or ADAPT, which is a program that integrates adult clients into the community and helps them live life without limits. And also today we have Rob Hurd, who's the parent of one of the clients in the ADAPT program, and also, frankly, one of the parents who helped us divide the, the ADAPT program. And the ADAPT program, I think, was his idea and the idea of parents like him. <clears throat> so let me 
start by asking a question of both of our panel members. Bethany, maybe you can speak to this first. What, what happens to individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities like autism spectrum disorder when they age out of the public support system typically? Right. Um, well, they have those legally mandated services like you talked about um, up until the age of about 22. And they go from receiving all of these one-to-one -one services to really having a big drop in services as they um, age out. And we've got a picture of a cliff here because that's probably one of the best analogies. Um, they kind of have all this support and they get up to that point. And um, if they don't have something kind of set up to continue those types of support, uh, they can really start to regress and uh, it's quite sad to see. Let's go to the next slide. Also, adults uh, with a diagnosis of autism and intellectual disability um, do age faster. They exhibit signs of aging faster than uh, adults without disabilities. And so we'll see signs of mental illness such as dementia come on as early as like the 30s. Um, we have a, uh, an example of this is we have a client who typically um, is very uh, easygoing, can express himself, and able to get his needs met. And as he ages, he is reverting back to childhood behaviors of aggression. Um, and so we do see that type of regression happen, and, and we always have to be on the lookout for um, those types of changes. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and a lot of times, like I said, you know, with the aging uh, happening earlier on, we might start to notice some unusual behavior or changes in um, how they're acting. And uh, sometimes our first impulse is to get a behavior analyst or get the team together and try to, you know, of course, figure out what's going on. We always want to start with the least invasive approach. And many times um, there could be a medical program or a medical issue going on that could be driving some of their frustration. For example, if their um, eyesight is beginning to uh, fail them, they could really get very frustrated, and especially if they're not verbal. Um, we, can, we can definitely expect a change of behavior. So we always want to start with that least invasive approach and kind of work from there. Okay. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, so Rob, with all this being said, as someone who's lived this experience uh, in your own family, what would you advise other families to be aware of as they work to find services and supports for adults with autism? Well, I think the first thing that, that I'm reminded of when we talk about the transition between uh, mandated services and non-mandated services is for parents and families to really understand that, that have been in the school system where you had mandated services, but they're limited resources. And, and a lot of times people got in arrangements where they had to fight for everything they, they wanted. There was a lot of adversarial relationships. When you go into non-mandated services, you really need to be part of a team and change the approach and have a more teamwork approach uh, and it, it helps get what your your uh, son or daughter needs because people can just say I, you can say I want this I want this I want this and they'll say well we don't want to serve you and so it's really important to really get on a team approach uh, when we first started uh, looking at what Jack's future was like I was fortunate to be in a job that I could uh, retire uh, early at the same date that Jack was graduating, turning 22. And so I left a, a career to um, support him because we didn't know what we were going to do. In the meantime, uh, my wife and several other folks, uh, some local agencies got together and said we need a community, a center-based uh, community uh, program. And that's how ADAPT got started. Uh, but at the same time, we also got involved with sponsored residential, which gave us resources through Medicaid uh, waiver. And uh, we were able to provide a program for my son that kept him busy in the community um, pretty much all day, which is something he really needed. The other piece of that, as far as, uh, I don't know if I come up later on, but the Medicaid waiver, that you've got to get that Medicaid waiver to get funding. And so a lot of folks, uh, are out in the community and, and have been really take care of their own uh, and all of a sudden parents get older and they don't have 
any resources and then they find out about Medicaid waiver and they find out there's a waiting list and they should have been on it for years and years. Uh, so it's really important to get to understand that piece of things. In terms of uh, your experience in the sponsored residential model, can you talk to us a little bit about what that was like? Sure. It was really uh, a perfect situation for us where we as a family became the provider for our son uh, and uh, we operated our home just like a group home. We had the same uh, guidelines and rules and we had people coming and checking our house regularly and home visits and, and fire drills and meds locked up and medication training. It was basically operating a group home for one. Some parent families do it. Sponsored res also other folks will take in somebody, adult with a disability, and they'll live in their home uh, as a family member with the same uh, regulations. The, the neat thing for us was we were able to hire our own staff and set up a schedule for Jack uh, to fit his needs. When you're looking at the school, you look at an individual education plan, you're, it's individualized, but it's based on the resources the school has, and you can only get so much. In the, with, the, with the individual service plan, when you do an exercise, what's important to, what's important for the individual, and you lock into what really is interesting for the individual, you can build off of those things, and you can be creative, and, and if you can't, don't have the resources, you can still find ways maybe to make it happen. If Jack likes art, and there's no art therapist, well, we had a friend that did art, and then we'd go there and do art. And he kept building these things uh, off of his strengths and interests, so he was really engaged in the activity. We knew when he got out of school that he liked going to the grocery store. We just knew he liked being there. And from that, uh, we had him going to the grocery store doing grocery lists, uh, grocery shopping with a list with his staff. And originally his goal was to pick an item off the shelf with three prompts. And now it's at the point where you say ragu spaghetti sauce, he'll get the ragu or the or the uh, the right one that you want. We're used to take a lot of prompts. And if you've never grocery shopped for someone else uh, and you say, I want crest toothpaste, <laughs> There's that narrows it down about 20 choices. So right. he's able to adapt and learn and enjoys the task. And it's every time we've been able to do uh, an activity like that, it's always grown and it's based on what he's interested in. So it's not like if I wanted, if I was interested in model trains and I said, Jack, come on, baseball, I'm going to do model trains because I like to do it. And he'd get upset. You know, how, how could you get upset when you know what I want to do? <laughs> but, but we built it off of what his strengths and interests were. And it just, it's, keep, it's kept evolving. His day is so busy uh, with things that he wants to do. He looks forward to each each activity. When so many times the treatment provider looks at those affinities um, as perseveration. Mm -hmm. So they look at it as something to be controlled and diminished as opposed to, frankly, uh, brought to bear. Uh, there's a guy named Ron Suskind. Um, I can't remember the name of the film. It was on Netflix recently. But um, basically using the son's uh, Affinity for Disney films to actually establish an effective communication strategy. Okay. I, we saw that in school. Uh, we had a, early on, when Jack was in elementary school. We had a teacher that, when he flapped his hands, wanted him to sit on his hands. Right. And when he's flapping his hands, he's expressing joy. Right. And so you're saying, don't express that joy. It's like, it's like oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, Bethany, um, could you speak to what you feel families and care providers should look like um, or should look for in terms of services for adults with autism? How, how, do, you, how do you shop? Absolutely. Well, you've heard us mention uh, applied behavior analysis a couple times already in this presentation. And this is definitely a growing profession. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. and. Um, it actually, I, I like what you were saying, Rob, about working with preferred activities and things like that because uh, a behavior analyst can work with a client and use things that motivate them, such as model trains or grocery shopping or preferred activities to uh, emit and display appropriate behavior to get that reinforcement. So uh, basically applied behavior analysis is based on the idea that every behavior has a function or a why and uh, or reinforcement. So like you were saying, with the kid flapping his hands, that's what he was, he was trying to say he's happy. Um, there's always a why. So 
Um, somebody may exhibit some maladaptive behaviors such as like self-injury, elopement, aggression. Well, they're admitting those behaviors because they've had a lifetime of reinforcement. Um, not that somebody has said good job, but perhaps what they were really needing, such as a break or in increased attention, is what they actually got when they admitted those behaviors. So in ABA, we try to understand what's motivating the individual to um, display behaviors that possibly, you know, we would want to change and they, they could change and open up more um, opportunities for themselves and then uh, teach them. And the word applied uh, just relates to teaching them in a very real life setting. So that might be home, school, community, church, uh, grocery store. Um, so it, it's real life teaching and really just a matter of giving them a better toolkit. We all have toolkits that we use, things that we know will work and not work. And unfortunately, a lot of individuals with disabilities um, have some very harmful behaviors and it's our job to give them a better toolkit. Um, you can go to the next slide. So <clears throat> when we talk about teaching skills for our adults um, and children, we really want to focus on functional living skills, meaning what can help them need less support and be a little more independent. And these skills are also very meaningful to their lives. Um, but assessments are a really key um, component of determining kind of where to start um, and determining where their level of learning is. Um, because sometimes it can be too, uh, very frustrating to start too high or too low, not knowing exactly where their, um, their skill level is. Next slide. So this is really a, a lifetime process, supporting them um, from childhood on into adulthood. And uh, like many things, the earlier you can start um, with the individual, the better. Early intervention is incredibly effective. Um, children are like little sponges as they're learning about their world around them. And if services can be incorporated um, at a young age, that's very, very beneficial. Um, However, they still go through adolescence and adulthood with changing needs and changing interests. And we want to always focus on teaching them basic living skills, uh, very functional living skills that uh, will open up more doors for them. Uh, ABA is a big part of that. I'm very biased. Um, but uh, as they become adults, like when they're children, they get one-to-one -one ABA services, one-to-one -one speech and all that. Um, as they uh, age out of the, the school age program, applied behavior analysis uh, can still be a part of their life, sometimes in a more consultative mode, um, but uh, it, it's still very, very good to um, use that. So our adults are just like us. They like to continually learn, and we want to base those on their personal preferences. Uh, it's been a really important innovation here at Kraft and under Bethany's leadership to integrate ABA services into our programming. Um, and we have been able to do it using uh, funding models that are in existence through the state, and we've been able to do it um, without having to sacrifice. Uh, frankly, it's been something that has worked for um, worked for these folks to allow us to ensure that they can remain in the stable placement with us in their, if they're in our group home settings, for example. Um, but historically, I don't see it being used all that widely in adult services. So I think we're really innovating in that area, and it's been very effective. And I would encourage um, healthcare um, administrators elsewhere to look at the possibilities with this, because at first you may think that there's no way we can afford that level of resource in this current funding model. But in reality, we, under Bethany's astute leadership, we've learned that in fact we can. So. Um, uh, just, just a, just a little plug there. Um, so we've talked about the needs that exist. Let's talk about how to meet the need. Um, specifically, what are some of the ways that we feel like we can fill the gaps that currently exist for adults with autism? Well, uh, as we were talking about the uh, community engagement uh, piece, the the gaps I see are are. Um, Voids, I guess, in their their lives. So they've got the community engagement. If if in in more residences, then uh, we talk about uh, circles of support, right? So everybody's got their circle of support. And if you look at the typical person who's in your inner circle, who's your closest people to you, uh, it's 
it's usually family members and that sort of thing, or you get the next ring, a circle, it's your neighbors and friends. And you look at our folks uh, with disabilities and their circle of, of supports and who's in their circle, and look how many of them are paid to be in their circle. And so when you look at that, in order to create consistency in, in their life, people are paid, that means they're not always going to work. <clears throat> and so if you, what we try to do with Jack is, is build his circle of supports with a lot of folks that weren't paid to be there. And that's through community engagement, getting them out in the community where people know him at the bowling alley. They know him at the Youth Development Center. They know him uh, out in the community as an individual. His staff takes them there. They're involved, but the staff can, can turn over. So when we, in October, we, uh, Jack moved into a group home in October for another company, Quorum, and we were able to keep his daily routine the same. So his circle of support, his daily routines stayed the same. The only thing that happened different was he sleeps in a different place. He still comes home with us two days a week, but the transition was so easy because we said, here's the new place. You're going to sleep with your friends here. You're still going to have your day. You're still going to see us. And it was, the transition was incredibly smooth because we're able to maintain that, that his community. It just terrifies me when you see these guys that have to get placed somewhere else and they move them across the state. Right. And you go, you know, how are you not going to have behavioral problems? You know, and, and then the, the person gets uh, blamed for having a behavior when you've totally disrupted everything they had. So I think part of filling the gap is, is creating a good quality of life for our guys that can be maintained on its own and not dependent on all these other resources. So I don't know if that answers the question. It does, because the longer I work in Grafton, the more I see the parallels between some of the innovations that are happening in behavioral health in general and in IDD services for adults. So what you're describing doesn't sound too different from uh, an intensive care coordination or high fidelity wraparound model for a kid with behavioral health. Um, where the idea is avoid the disruption, if at all you can, avoid the disruption of, the, of an institutional setting and keep them engaged with the community, and that community shouldn't be primarily paid supports. And, and um, it's funny how much synergy there is between the two things. And, and we're exploring that at Grafton because I don't think that there's been a lot of um, application of wraparound uh, philosophy to children in our uh, services, and I think there's plenty of room for innovation. And you look at this population that hasn't been in public for, right. well, this is the first, what, first 20, last 20 years at the beginning of them being in the population before, you know, when I was growing up, there, you know, there's a kid in that house, I've never seen them. Right. And, right. But I know that there's, a, yeah, and, and you just didn't see them. But now you go to the grocery store, you got folks working there, and you've got, you know, it's just, it's a part of our life. Yeah. Plus the incident. I mean, Jack's 35, well, he was one in 10,000 births to have autism. Now, what is it, one in 57 or 67 or something? Yeah. So, yeah. everybody, yeah. Going down. Yeah. everybody knows somebody yeah. they're either related to or neighbor that has autism, and it wasn't always the case. And so, there's a lot more acceptance before community engagement, and that's what sort of because it's not a mystery to people. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and, and need uh, can be the start of something like the adapt story. I know that uh, was started uh, by you and some other parents kind of in the same boat. Your um, child was aging out of the school system and you were kind of looking for that next step. And so I think understanding the whole support concept and keeping that network strong um, is good for support, but it's also good for building. And you know, so now we have a group day program called ADAPT that's center based and teach, teaches skills throughout the day based on preferred activities through recreational, volunteer, social, music, arts and crafts, and all that good stuff, um, activities. Um, and then our clients will progress from the ADAPT program, from a center-based program, out into our uh, community engagement program. And currently, we've got about 40 clients participating in our community engagement program. And they have just forged all kinds of territory out in the community. And it's really neat to see the connections that they're um, making and the opportunities that are afforded to them. And um, anything from, you know, leisure activities, say the walking club at the mall, 
to volunteering at the SPCA to walk some dogs, uh, you know, all based on what they're interested in, but um, there really is a progression, and it's important to remember that adults want to keep learning, too, adults with disabilities, just like all of us, and it gives them a great sense of um, satisfaction and, and accomplishment. Go to the next slide. Looks like my slide. <laughs> so, uh, one of the exciting things about it, uh, well, first the terrifying thing was when we were aging out of school, Jack had been on a couple trial visits to like work at Goodwill, and, and he got, they said they couldn't support him there because he needed more support. Things like the, uh, the, um, the work, what brand's called, the workshop. Uh, it was too noisy and they didn't have the support, and there was really nothing available for them. So that's when this group got together and said, let's do a, a community based uh, support. And then we uh, contracted with Grafton to, to operate it, and it started off as this community based thing. It's really exciting to see this or to the center based, it's really exciting to see the growth in the community engagement because not only are people growing into uh, developed to, to a point where they can grow out the community, but now we can reach so many more people. I mean, originally we had a cap of about 14 people we could serve as the building space and staff space, and now it just keeps growing. I think one of the neat, exciting things has been when we first started the community engagement, or first talked about community engagement, there was like I think terror on the staff. <laughs> There's terror on the staff. Everywhere. Right. The expectation we tend to we tend to hold the bar down low on our our folks and and because we think we know them. And uh, my favorite example of that is having a meeting one time and we're talking about Jack wanting to take out the trash. The, you know, in my mind, Jack had autism. He couldn't learn how to tie the trash bag. And so it never occurred to me. And then I, we're in a meeting, and Jessica we somehow came up, and Jessica said, Jack ties the trash up and puts it away. I said, what do you mean ties the trash up? And we got tired of him uh, asking us to tie so we taught him how to do it. I lowered the bar and said he can't do it, and they had greater expectations. And so the more we can expand the expectation, the more results we're going to see. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have an expectation that's not filled versus saying you can't even try it. And so, yeah, so uh, Jack's life and schedule is evolved based on that. His, the, the schedule you see on the, the screen, he, we learned that he needs to stay busy. So you see Monday, Tuesday, he's out from about 8.30 until 5 or 6 every day. He's doing volunteer work in the community. The Youth Development Center is a local uh, like rec center, and he used to just do the trash. Now he uh, loads the sodas and the snack machines with some support. Uh, he goes on runs to buy that stuff with his staff. He works at the SPCA thrift store, uh, and he's got to the point where he would just do sort books. Now he sorts clothes. They're moving to a new location. He's helping with the uh, sorting there, uh, and he, sometimes he works the front and helps bag things, and it just keeps growing and growing. Uh, he's really active in the community. He, when he first started uh, bowling, he didn't seem to show much interest, and then something clicked, and now he goes bowling twice a week, and he, he, uh, he's got a Fred Flintstone kind of style to him, but he'll bowl 130, 135 at times. He beat me if I'm bowling with him. Uh, so but keeping that busy with things that you are he's interested in has been the key for us. Uh, From a provider perspective, I, I don't want to torture this metaphor, but it's a good one. Our our um, expectations and uh, targets for what we want our services to look like rise to a certain level, often limited by our funding streams and limited by our own history. Uh, as professionals, and often it's the parents who can inspire us to try something different and move in a new direction. And I think adult services is right for that kind of family engagement to help drag us into creative, innovative ways of doing this that we haven't thought of, and frankly, probably won't think of without your help. I, well, I think that some of it is human nature. When Jack was in special ed in school, typically had a teacher for three years. And looking back on it, 
you can see the first year he's done with the teacher, there was growth. Second year, not so much. Third year, it's plateaued because the teacher decided they knew what he could do and what he could do. And it's human nature for all of us, so that's why it's really important, I think, helpful to have multiple uh, people involved in life, whether it's within one organization or multiple organizations, where you get input from other people and they, they share things. And Jack does things for other people he won't do for me or I won't even think of doing. I mean, he'll drink a soda. He used to drink a soda like two seconds. And I just say, well, it's all just a mess, Jack. And he, we had a staff that said, this is crazy. And so she taught him to count to 10 or between sips. Or, okay. And it's just like, I never want to, I just wasn't in my thought process that it was something you could manage. So, and, and I think a lot of times we just kind of try to hurry through processes, hurry through activities in that caregiver mode. But when you think about it, like that example, there's so many opportunities teach our clients, our family members, meaningful skills. I'm sure Jack didn't have as much indigestion after he drank it slowly and things like that. And so, you know, it's not just families, but um, society really has to have that um, understanding of the responsibilities that they share to encourage and embrace the individuals that we serve. I'm going to grab that transition, Bethany. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what success might look like for adults with autism? Sure. So uh, it goes back to that, you know, concept of meaningful skills. Um, here at Grafton, we use a really great tool uh, we call the AFOLS, Assessment of Functional Living Skills. Um, and assessments are really key. They're, they can be very user friendly. This is a very simple one. Um, and it basically helps you establish a baseline of uh, skill level in, in different areas that might pertain to, say, self care or communication or community-based, um, you know, behavioral repertoire. And so you, it gives you the tools to know kind of where to start teaching that individual and what would be the natural next progression for them. Because like I mentioned before, if you start too high or too low, um, it can be frustrating for everybody. And especially, the, you know, the teacher, and you kind of just give up and you rush through activities and things like that. So, um, and a big key component of that as well with, with teaching new skills is, um, working with what the client is interested in, and that's how it kind of brings the motivational piece into it. Um, and then assessments can be done every three or six months um, to reassess progress. It also lets us know if we're doing the right thing or we should try something a little bit different. But it's also a really great communication tool for stakeholders, like parents, um, case managers, um, outside agencies. They're very easy to understand and you can show that skill progression over time. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the forest from the trees when you're in the thick of it in that day-to-day -day grind, but then when you come back and you do that assessment again, you can color in more boxes and that kind of thing. It's, it's actually reinforcing the teacher's behavior and at Rafton it would be the staff. Um, so at Rafton we have our staff do the, the baseline and then the assessments every three months. And that's a direct reflection of the effort that they've made with our clients and how our clients have um, resisted, the, resisted the challenge. I can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is an example of a score sheet. So what we would do is take a baseline. And so at the very bottom, it's kind of difficult to see, but there's different categories like self-management, communication, uh, toileting, grooming, on and on. So it kind of divides everything up into different categories and gives you an idea of where they're at. Um, some clients will top out very low, um, others can be a little higher functioning, but it inevitably shows us where there can also be splinter skills. Um, so where they might may understand a behavior at a certain level, but then they jump to one much higher and they don't know the, the behaviors in between or the steps in between. Um, so, like I said, it really lets us know where to start, and um, then every three, six, nine months, you do the reassessment. This goes with a, a workbook that helps you understand what to fill in, and you'll do it in different colors, and that way you can kind of see the growth, and of course, here at Graph, and we love data, so we chart everything and graph everything, and um, it's like our biggest bragging thing. It's just, we're so proud of our clients, and, and they should be proud of themselves as well. Well, when you go to a curriculum like this, you also are providing every uh, staff member kind of a roadmap of where to focus next. It's everything built on everything else, but everyone's kind of singing from the same hymnal, and that's very important. It, in uh, at more evidences, we have to keep a lot of data as well, and I, I used it to drive me nuts keeping track and doing the quarterly. And, but really, it makes you see progress that 
you might not see that like when Jack was really young before I mean he was in school he was in a uh, experimental medication that created he two percent had got aggressive which he was one of the winners there and so we were getting hit 30 pounds a day and when he was about I don't know five six years old my wife will correct me but somewhere around there but keeping the data as we reduce the medication you're able to tell that well it's not 30 and we're not 20 but when you're going from that it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere and so it's really important plus to see when you're doing something right growth but also let you know when, okay this isn't working let's change this up we're at a plateau okay what can we do do we need to to stimulate uh do we need to adapt this or do we need to cheerlead better or what do we have to do to make this happen so the data is really important as much as it can be a pain to collect. <laughs> yeah, it is, and, and I've always tried to have a very simplistic approach to mostly anything I've done in life and in my profession. But you know, I think the simpler things are, the easier they are to do, um, the more integrity you're going to have in that process. And you know, there's the concept of generalization too. So, like at Grafton, where we have group homes, we obviously don't have staff say on 24-7, we obviously have different um, staff coming in and out. So this helps us work with the same skills with our clients across shifts, across staff, across settings and, and behaviors. That's really important. All right. Well, as our final topic for today, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about um, what the community can do. I mean, what is the role of the community in supporting adults with autism and other complex challenges? So what did you both to comment on that? I think it really goes back to that, um, like you talked about, Ross, the circle of support and having a strong partnership with uh, members of our community. I mean, this day and age, it's a, it's a real far cry from where we have been as recently as just a generation or two ago. Um, society has done a 180, and um, they're much more supportive than we would have thought in the beginning of launching our community engagement program. But We'll be out and about in the community, and, and a lot of our staff wear graphs and t-shirts, and um, you know, we'll have members of the community thank us and encourage our clients, and um, it's just, it's wonderful to see that type of support. Um, and again, that goes back to our responsibility as a society. Um, we work with businesses and organizations um, on a more routine um, schedule to come and volunteer and, and work with them. Um, and it's a natural stepping stone to the ultimate goal, which would be um, employment. So we're really helping to change that um, stigma that we once had. It used to be if you pulled up to an ice cream shop and the big white Grafton van, you know, everybody cleared out. And uh, now it's just, we're just part of our society and, and our, our clients are a very big, important part of our society. So, and they have a lot to teach us. So. Um, I am extremely thankful for the, the community that we live in and just society's approach to individuals with disabilities and supporting them. Um, and, and we're very, very fortunate. I think this is where relationship building really comes in, comes to play, where you get involved. Uh, Jack's been volunteering at, well, he started off as a, a camp, a camper at Youth Development Center. He's been involved with YDC one way or another for probably 20 years and that relationship is so support that they he's an important part of their program for them the SBCA he's an important part of what they do so building those relationships and going into it with saying here's the problems you might see and we're going to be here to help but no going up front and having going through your first crisis in a volunteer place and then surviving it <laughs> is a bond mm -hmm. that, you, can't, that, you, that you, you don't lose. And so finding those people in the community that are willing to support our ads and then just keeping nurturing that and, and keep building on it and then that can be uh, grow onto another uh, opportunity. And, and there's so many more. I mean, just when we first started at that, trying to find volunteer opportunities were, were very limited. Uh, but then one of the favorite stories that when they first went to the community engagement, I think the plan was that a group would go to one of the sites and stay there for a while and rotate to another site. And then I guess one of the groups was at a nurse, it was a nursing home yeah. and, and, uh, they were getting ready to rotate and the people in the nursing home, we can't take our, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
we've got a relationship with these people. So, I mean, the unintended consequences that are positive are always a joy. Yeah. So, so that's that's how that's how we get you know community to build and, and and be supportive. And, and I, and I wanted to mention too, you know, you'll notice that inverse relationship between those problem behaviors going down as their gathering skills go up because we're helping them to meet the needs that they otherwise used to meet with other types of behavior. And um, you see that sense of pride and they care what they look like and they and they care about meeting up with the coffee with cops on Tuesdays at the daily grind. I mean, and the and the police officers are looking forward to seeing our clients there. I mean that's that's the whole idea, and just that social reinforcement um, is priceless. So I think that we probably want to make a point to, to talk a little bit about the ARC here. Um, Rob, you have a you have personal experience with the ARC. I, I was, yeah, I've been involved in the ARC for a little while. I've been trading off being executive director or president, uh, not as active as I was, but I've kind of tried to retire a bit. But, uh, Basically, if you want to manage this system, there's no single gatekeeper that you can go to that can talk about Medicaid waiver, can talk about what kind of insurance issues, or can talk about. There's so many different silos, uh, and the ARC can help you navigate the system uh, and, and get through the Medicaid waiver or whatever. I mean, when we when Jack first became eligible for Social Security, I mean, I've been in human services for a whole career. My wife was a special ed teacher and 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 uh, we were figuring out we were pretty, you know, fairly educated uh, people in the system. We almost threw the social security application away. It was so crazy. And you just sit there going, what happens to people that, that just don't have the ability or the patience to deal with this stuff? And it's just confusing. And you can't just go to one person to tell you all the things. So uh, organizations like the ARC can help you as a resource travel through that system. And you can go on the National ARC site to see where the local chapters are. We have a local chapter in Winchester. The State ARC is a really good uh, resources in, resource in Virginia. And there's just uh, just a lot of resources available to just reach out and uh, every door you go through tells you about some more doors mm -hmm. you know and it's just getting through that first door sometimes but it's a, it's it's no one's going to do it for you it takes a lot of work and you've got to be the number one advocate uh, to get things to happen and like I say it's you got to be part of a team you can't be if you want to have the most effective situation you want to be part of a team and not uh, the enemy. And so if you develop a, a negative rapport with the folks that are trying to take care of your child or adult son or daughter, it's not going to be a good relationship as if you can do a team approach. What other way do you, like, I would consider you at this point, 35 years in, to be what I would call a super user parent. <laughs> you use the whole system. You know, you build part of the system yourself. How do you, how would you advise parents who are may just be learning of the developmental disability of their child or, or encountering that that cliff from child? How do they find the super users besides places like the ARC? I think a lot of it's just uh, well, like through the ARC, you can get names and if you're involved in these programs. The thing I when I talk to younger families. The first thing I said, don't let me terrify you. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. well, I remember when we were first in diagnosis, we lived in uh, Northern Virginia and we were involved in a support group that was in Fairfax. And it, there was the Autism, Autism Society and there were a lot of older members with folks, their kids were in the training center. Mm -hmm. And so here we are with this you know, four or five year old just diagnosed and we're, we're sitting there talking to these people that are, elderly themselves and they got the 40, 50 year old year old children in the training centers and we're going, what? You know, that's our future? So the, the future, what we got was not even imaginable. You know, and so the future for somebody that's getting diagnosis right now, it's not imaginable. So so you what the thing is, keep current, get involved with an organization or a support group that is active and be part of the evolution, and so you can can know what's going on. And it's 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 work, and and it takes a lot of time. And I, I heard some 
me describe, instead of having a child with autism, they were a family uh, affected by autism. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that because it's true. My daughter uh, has been affected by autism. My wife and I have been affected by autism. Uh, my son has really been affected by autism. But I think it's really descriptive because it, it's, if you think it's just that one person, or it's not like someone's got a broken leg, uh, it's, it's there's a, it's a whole, it's a family commitment. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the love of a parent, it's amazing what can come from that, um, just pulling together support. Um, even the local library, local community service boards, um, offices of Social Security, but I, I would agree, probably one of the best places to start is the ARC website. It's very user-friendly, and I think probably one of the biggest challenges is just getting the ball rolling, because yeah. it can be extremely intimidating, but um, I think uh, that's probably the hardest part, and then one step will lead you to the next, and you keep advocating. Right, you got to get, you got to, you know, if you don't know about the Medicaid waiver, start with that, mm -hmm. and get involved with the community service uh, yeah. board, and, and get a case manager, and and help have them help you walk down the line, uh, and that'll be one of the, the components. But uh, it it's a complicated system. It's gotten easier, I think, uh, and there's more supports and there's more people out there. But it's still you just gotta stay on it and don't be afraid to say, hey, let's try something new. Yeah. Uh, well, and the pressure needs to stay on because um, when you look, when I came to grad and I came from a traditional children serving behavioral health background. And when I was introduced to the waiver system, my head exploded. I couldn't understand it. Um, it didn't seem quite fair. There was a lottery aspect to it. I know it's based on need as well. But it was mind-blowing to me, and especially because at the same time we were doing consultation work in Australia, which was rolling out an entire national disability insurance scheme where anybody with a disability born in that country would receive whatever services were deemed necessary. lot of questions but one that we do have is could you speak to what trends you see in the future what do you see this environment looking like in say 5 10 or even 20 years down the line well again I kind of talked about a little bit of what my hope would be um, and I Lord knows I don't want to veer into the political realm here but when you look at models in other countries that acknowledge that disabilities are potential for everyone and therefore 
services for disability should be a universal human right as opposed to uh, something that you get if you happen to win the lottery or if your situation becomes so disrupted that you're in danger for your own life. If we can get beyond that, uh, I think that all kinds of things will open up. Um, and I also feel like um, <clears throat> what Ralph was talking about relative to the community as a whole being seen as, uh, in essence, the network of support of the system of care around the kid as opposed to a paid slash professional model. Some sort of blended model seems to be the answer, and frankly, uh, it's one of the few times in the world where the, the solution actually probably costs less than the solution we have right now isn't working as well. Um, if we can really be creative about engaging community supports, you can avoid the incredibly expensive, difficult, and frankly risky institutional care that sometimes has to happen. I would like to see us get to the point where we're addressing the need and not so much the label. Uh, in the development, in the in the disability community, we go down to the state legislature uh, to support something. Often, it's the autism group that is in, in conflict with the brain injury group, which is in conflict with the, the the other folks. And so we're all fighting the same battle. It would seem an ideal situation. What if, if you have an individual that needs support with toileting or or meal prep or whatever? It wouldn't matter why. You would just provide the support, not say, "Oh, you don't fit the description." Uh, I mean, it's, it's 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 almost obscene the way we treat brain injury folks versus people with autism because there's not a brain injury waiver. At least last time I saw there wasn't, and the same they have a lot of the same issues and needs. So why do we get into this, these these silos when this person needs one-on-one -on -one support? Does, why does it matter why? Yeah, and hopefully in the future we can we can address that and, and be in like you said universal uh, protection for everyone. Why why not? I'm ready to help you. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the other thing I'm going to say. I'm out on a limb here, but you know if if we're spending 17 pentagons worth of dollars on the current healthcare system. Let's just pretend we can squeeze one pentagon out of it with a more efficient healthcare system and give it to the disabled population so that they can get what they need. I mean, there are solutions out there, but uh, you know, everything is is efficiency based and money based, and you know, these different sectors of the disabled population are fighting over the same pool of funds right now. So Virginia just finally doing Medicaid waiver, although it doesn't affect this population directly. It affects the people that support this population. We had all of our staff were part-time staff, and they couldn't afford health insurance. Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Medicaid expansion. So it helps give. If you're supporting the people that are working part-time, it gives them stability, which gives their clients stability because they don't have turnover. It's just so everyone benefits, and the community benefits. It's out of my mind. Well, yeah. and the need is just increasing. So okay. we we have to really really come together. It's about unifying. Yep. Like Absolutely. Any other questions, Julia? Yeah, there is one um, question that came in about what does an adult with autism do when they are only on the waiver wait list but have no family support? Wow. That's, that's, that's a the worst nightmare. They do have uh, they do have a program now that helps. Uh, with some resources to help people on the waiting list. Uh, I'm, I'm not really exactly what the name is. I know that, that, that there's uh, supports available. Uh, there, I would assume there would be a guardian or someone there or, or, uh, that would be supportive of the person, but I don't know. Let me ask you a funny question. Um, the CSD of each locality is tasked with determining who should qualify for whatever waivers are made available based upon their level of need, right? I think it's now been, I'm not really current on this, but I think it's now been filtered down statewide versus by region to help uh, with the triage piece of it, but it's, okay, is there advocacy that can happen into that system or is that a closed system where they're making that decision with no inputs from I think it's based on the information the case manager has. Okay. It, 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 the problem is the, the, the funding. We have more people coming to the 
system and they're funded, you know, they're not on the word of, I forget how many thousands, 10,000 people on the waiting list or something like that. And so they fund a thousand. Yeah. And then how many people are aging out, turning 22? There's something so strange to me about the idea that we celebrate when our region has been granted more waiver slots. I was thinking to myself, why is this something that should yeah. be thrown out there? Um, shouldn't this be? No. Yeah. 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 The, so the answer is we don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's but tough. I, and I think it goes back to uh, the support system and. And, you know, of course, if they don't have a family to advocate for them, I mean, just society having that perspective of these, these individuals are a part of our society and, and um, we do need to support them. I, I think it goes back to just that support circle. Well, and there will be change because with the prevalence of autism going the direction it's going, you can't find somebody in public without a family member with intellectual or developmental disability. And that is going to lead to system reform. Right. Um, and with one of the gaps in service talking about this particular question is, if the per, there's the there's not a whole lot of options for uh, private guardianships. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guardianships that are not family members that are company based, uh, a lot of them aren't in this area. Mm -hmm. They're guardians for for people outside of the area. Uh, so somebody like this person could have a guardian. It's not even in the area they live in, or they could have it. Minimally, they should have authorized rep. Somebody that's interested in that person, they can support that person uh, during this transition and beyond. Sure. 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 Anything else, Julia? No, that is the last question that we um, had come in. Of course, if anyone has questions. Um, that they'd like to submit after the webinar, we'd be happy to try and answer those as well. But that was the last question for today, Scott. Okay, all right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating today. And um, I want to thank certainly both Bethany and Rob for, for presenting. It's an interesting conversation, very stimulating conversation. Um, we hope to continue the conversation with you um, by staying in touch with you on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or using the hashtag uh, Grafton Approach. Uh, you can also find us online at www.grafton.org, uh, and we would love to, to get feedback and input from anybody uh, who participated today. So on behalf of all of us, thank you once again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.